Throughout the course of this class, we're not going to be doing PowerPoints per se. We're going to use some tools and techniques that we have here, um, some demonstration product, and we'll explain to you where you can get some of these to practice. And also, I have on my desk a board. And this board, if you look at it, here's my hand. So I have the fuses down the side. The fuse at the top feeds this series circuit. The next fuse down feeds this parallel circuit. The next fuse down feeds the circuit with the relay and the fan. And then we have some other components to the side. We have some resistors. We have a secondary bulb we can put in series. Um, I have a rheostat. I have various ways of adding resistance. This point down here is a ground, <clears throat> which is why you can see I have a ground wire hooked up here. So if I turn the switch on and that ground isn't active, I basically have a switch on either side of that circuit if I want it, um, because I can do some other demonstrations with that later. So uh, Rich, what do you think about all these laws and rules and math and trying to memorize all those things. Do you like it? Everybody that's come to my class knows I hate math and I don't like talking about the laws. I know they're necessary. We have to discuss them, but uh, it's, uh, it's not where I like to go because I sometimes feel like it just puts guys to sleep. Okay. Pete? They're especially important, I think, um, to understand uh, in case you get into trouble. And if you get into trouble on a car and you need to be able to prove something out, that's where the law or the laws that govern the circuits are going to be uh, your best, your best friend, especially when you're doing any type of circuit analysis and you're trying to prove something out and it's just not working for you. That's when the circuit laws become important. Okay. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so what kind of ways have what kind of ways have have you guys ever been testing on a circuit and and gotten gotten a result that just doesn't make sense give me an answer in chat yes no have you ever have you ever had your backside put in a bucket by a car over an electrical issue and i'm going to raise my hand and say i definitely have so yes, okay, getting a few, <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's an emphatic yes there, okay. Um, one of the ones that, I, I'm going to give you two in, in my working career that really stuck in my head. And one was a, a blower motor on a vehicle. I had purchased one of those new logic probes. You plug it into the cigarette lighter, hook it up to the battery, and you, you, you touch it to a circuit. And if it was, if it had power there, it went me and gave you a red light. And if it found a ground, it went Merp, and it gave you a green light. And it was the coolest thing since sliced bread. You could put it on the, the control side of a coil and have somebody crank it. It would flash red green, showing you that the circuit was toggling on and off. And I was like, this is cool. And I started using it for diagnosis. And uh, I was testing the blower motor. And I put my test lead at the positive side of the blower motor with the blower turned on. And I got meep and a red light. And I touched it to the ground side. It went merp. And I had a green light. And I ordered a blower motor. It didn't fix it. Because I only had about a volt and a half of power coming to the blower motor because of a problem with a wire with almost all the strands broken. And it doesn't take much to have that LED go me. <laughs> and I learned the hard way that I should have actually used a voltmeter and tested what was available with the circuit trying to work. So I bought my customer a blower motor that day. And the other one was just really bizarre and I, and we're not even going to get into it, but I had a, I had a battery that was going dead on a Volvo diesel 
And that one was just so bizarre as to what it, the sequence of events that had to happen for that circuit to stay energized and kill the battery that we're just going to leave it for the nightmares of repair and talk about it another day. But we've all had that. We've all had power probes can be misleading. And that's kind of where I was going with that. So uh, um, uh, somebody said that in, in, in chat. And they absolutely can be. Can they be an awesome tool? Absolutely. But Rich did a, Rich did a class. Didn't you do that at Vision here recently? Mm -hmm. With uh, electrical tools and testing techniques. And there's, there's tools that are great for some things and tools that can cause struggles and difficulties. In chat, tell me what you think is an advanced electrical topic. What is advanced electricity as opposed to basic electricity or foundational electricity, which is what we're talking about here? Is there such a thing as advanced electricity? And what would you say it is? Answers in the past have been things like CAN communications. The sensor logic. There were a couple of guesses like that of how the computer gets its information from previous classes. Right. We, we had comments like CAN communication networks, things like that. And, and, and I guess one of the comments, one of the discussions Rich and I and Pete and I have all had is if we're trying to learn to read and write as an infant or with a new language or anything like that, the first thing we tend to learn is the alphabet. Here's all the symbols. Pulse width, somebody offered up. And a pulse width is turning a signal on and off in a pattern. And it seems advanced until you start seeing it more and more. And then you start to realize how we're using it. And we're going to get to that in a second version of this class. But realize, we've, you know, we're going to spend about an hour and a half here. And this is a topic that can easily cover a couple of days. So we're going to touch on some things. And hopefully, it'll spark some questions. You learn that alphabet. And if it's the English alphabet, you start to learn the rules. And you start to learn, well, what, what kind of sounds do these letters make? So you'll learn A is for apple and B is for boy, and C is for cat. And we start associating letters with sounds. And then we start to learn that, well, if I put, if I put letters together like C and H, I go from C for cat to CH for change or chalice or something else. Now, the difference between electricity for the most part and language is, Electricity is logical. There are rules. It's not Rich's suggestion, Pete's ideas, or Jim's guesses. There are rules for how electricity is going to behave. But you keep building these letters and combinations together until all of a sudden you're reading words like dichlorodifluoromethane, which is R12, or stoichiometry. Oh, now we're, now we're getting advanced because we're starting to talk about engine management. But those words, they now string together to convey bigger ideas. And then we put them together into sentences and paragraphs and books and novels and whatever. But they're all built off of the letters, off of those base rules, those base building blocks. So that's the way I've always encouraged students to think about electricity. So... What do you consider electricity to be? Some of the answers we've gotten in other classes have been things like um, it's, it's electrons moving around between atoms. And I guess the, the reason I get to be a stickler on rules and laws is the way we think about something, the way we see it in our head and how it works is what gives us the ability to ask questions. If I know it's supposed to do this and it's not happening, what can cause this not to happen? So in my head, I'll be, well, it could be this, it could be this, and it could be this, and then I'll go look for those things. So if you had like a, a bar of copper in front of you on the table, those electrons will be moving amongst those copper atoms freely because of the nature of that material, of that atom. And they'll move freely. But for our purposes, we want to think of, it's the controlled flow of electrons. We're directing it. We don't allow it to wander around. We harness it and we use it to do work. 
And so that's where we really want to go with electricity. If there is, I started with a slide because, you know, current is the rate of flow of electric charge, but we do need to know that it's a controlled flow of electrons and electrons are those negatively charged particles around an atom. Now, how many, how many people could tell me what is the best element to conduct electricity at room temperature? And I'm going to give you choices. Would you think it's copper, iron, gold, or silver? I got one silver and one gold. We have ourselves a showdown. Gold. Gold. Okay. Quite a few golds and some silvers. So, so let me jump in here. We tend to think about gold or gold comes to mind because we know we pay extra for the gold plated connectors, right? So they must be better. For the engineer or somebody building the circuit, there's a time to use gold. There's a time to use silver. There's a time to use copper. There's a time to use different alloys and so forth. Um, gold's claim to fame. And, and by the way, everything that I just told you, the thing that gives, um, that gives those materials the ability to conduct electricity easily is because the number of electrons going around an atom, they, they go into shells and they have different orbits and layers, kind of like the space stations closer than other things. And, and it depends on the speed and size and all that. And we won't get into all that science. The very outer ring, if an atom only has one electron in that outer ring, think about it like one century walking, walking itself around a, a, a station to be guarded. Pretty easy to pick off. And so single electrons in the valence ring are easy to pick off. If, and that makes it a good conductor. If we have as many as eight, which is the max that you can have in an outer ring, those things are insulators. So gold, silver, copper, iron, they all have a single electron out there. But even so, there's a term called resistivity. And that's an actual measurement of how much resistance a fixed quantity of material has to a known electrical charge being applied to it. And so the things with the lowest amount of resistance to the, allowing those electrons to move are going to flow the current better. And silver is what does it. The reason we use gold is because it's soft. And if it's in a terminal and there's vibration, it's not going to pill up or get um, um, little pinpoints on it because it stays soft. So we maintain a good connection. So that's why you see airbag terminals and things like that will have gold plated connectors from the factory. And some manufacturers even found that they had to do it on their fuel injectors because of the vibration and the heat causing an increase in resistance. And if you want proof that silver is a good conductor, you got to look no farther than HDMI cables. A high quality HDMI cable that can carry the best video and audio is very expensive. And the reason it's so expensive is because it is high in elemental silver. And that's how they get that to work. So when we start talking about moving electrons in a closed or a, in a controlled flow, we are, we are trying to do some work. If there is no current flow in a circuit, then there's no work being done. And we will see things like some, sometimes one of the best ways to start teaching electricity is to start teaching current flow. If we have no current flow, that circuit is open and we, we need to be precise. But if we see zero current flow, there's no work being done. So if there's no work being done, we got to figure out why. And then what are we going to have to look at? Well, we'll have to look at voltage. And voltage is what? How would you describe voltage, Rich? Uh, pressure. Pressure? Potential? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so how am I going to measure that potential? With a voltmeter, right? Yes. 
So how would you describe what those two leads do? Those two leads, uh, um, when measuring voltage, those two leads give us the difference in pressure or potential between those two points. Your voltmeter essentially becomes a calculator. It just subtracts one number from the other and gives us the difference in potential or pressure between those two points. Okay, so let's, let's do something here. Meet Wilson. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I've had this voltmeter for a long time. And if I touch those two leads together, it zeroes out rather nicely, right? You can see that voltmeter okay, guys? Lighting looks good. Yeah, we can see it fine. Awesome. When I have the leads out here floating in the air, you get those little small numbers to the side. But I'm going to go and I'm going to connect this negative lead here to these two terminals that are coming into this board. I'm gonna touch here and I'm gonna touch here. And what do I see? I've got 14.16 volts according to this meter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you see no loads working on this meter, correct? Correct. Okay. So if there was current flow, if there's no current flow now and we induce some current flow, what do you think is going to happen to this voltage here at the side of the board? Is it going to stay the same or should it drop a little bit? Come on, guys, jump in chat. Drop, drop, a, drop. drop a nil, drop, drop. Okay, good. Okay. Do you think the drop will go up as we add loads? Yes, no, yes. Okay, so let's do this. I got 14.16, I'm gonna turn on this one bulb. It dropped about 0 0.05, 0 0.06 volts. Why did it drop? Well, the reason it dropped is because if I move this, you'll see I've got a power supply back here. And that power supply is sending power out through a series of wires. I use speaker wires and quick connectors because it's easy to set up in class <clears throat> and coming back to this board. So the drop we're seeing is not between where the power comes in and the device that we turned on, but it's from the power supply to here. So on the car, we want to check source. Then that would either be the battery or the alternator, right? But here we're showing you that there's a drop from the power supply. If I put more work on this circuit, I'm going to increase the amount of drop. And I'm not talking about in the circuits. I'm talking about coming to this board, turned on some more lights, and we dropped some more supply, didn't we? Things have got a little out of focus there. So everything has a natural resistance. And we can measure that change with the voltmeter as we're doing our tests. <clears throat> so let me pull this back. So we're measuring that pressure. And when we turn the loads on, we reduce the amount of pressure coming to that board. So that uh, I always like to take a conversation like this and go from being boring and talking about laws and rules and I like to apply it to a vehicle. Out underneath the hood, we've got the, the charging system, we've got the battery, that's where everything comes from. In the car and space throughout the car, we have computer modules. What does almost every computer module have as a data PID that we can usually see? Do we have voltage applied? or the, the voltage coming into the module, is that a PID you can see on a lot of scan tools? Absolutely. And so every computer module that's trying to make decisions and control components is gonna have to know how much voltage do I have to work with? How much force do I have to control the components that I'm dealing with? So that's one of the important pieces of the puzzle. Resistance 
Resistance is good or bad? Answer good or bad. And if you can't answer good, good or bad, give me a different word. Something that you think in your head. Is resistance good, bad, or something else? Depends. Oh, depends. Sometimes, Randy says it's necessary, necessary or needed. Okay. Bankle says both. Both. So if, if we have resistance in a component that's doing work, and it, we have to have that resistance to do work, that's intended. The wires that we use to build the circuit, if they're appropriately sized with the right material, they're going to have some resistance, but that's okay. It's something that we wanted. <clears throat> so resistance can either be intended or unintended. And that's part of the job that we have to figure out. And we can do that a couple different ways. Can you, can you use an ohm meter to measure resistance? Absolutely you can. Is it the best way to measure resistance? Or is it better to figure out what's going on dynamically? And we're going to demonstrate that as we move forward here. And then <laughs> we get into the power conversation, right? Rich, you love the power conversation. Of course I do. Of course you do. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, well, I want to stick to power in a DC circuit right now. We'll get into AC circuits another time. This is a slide I just chose to have in here. But for the purpose of a, of, a, of a DC circuit, power is calculated by the available volts and the amperage. So how many volts am I using to push how many amps? And if I multiply the two of those together, I'll get power or the measurement of wattage. Question on the voltage. You said that the drop is from the power source. Okay, but what happens to the volts from the load? Does it also drop or go up? You said that the drop is from the power source, but what happens to the volts from the load? So let me try and answer the question this way. If I leave that negative lead and I go, so if I'm right here and I'm looking at 13.95 volts, I'm going to turn this other load, let it come back up to 1411. So if I move my lead farther down the circuit, let me go right here. I dropped a hundredth of a volt. Do you see that? So from here to here, I went from 1411 to 1410. If I go through the switch contacts, to this point at the bulb, I'm now at 14.07. So the voltage is continuing to drop as I follow the current path. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. If I get to the other side of the load, now my, my potential has dropped to almost nothing because the work being done here is causing the potential to drop because we're doing work. And that's normal voltage behavior in the circuit. And as I continue to get closer back to the ground path, it goes down even farther until essentially I'm just touching ground to ground and things zero out. Does that answer the question that you had, Abraham? Yes. Yes, okay. Now, there's two ways to look at a voltage drop in a circuit. One is to take a measurement at one point. So there's my 1411. And to take a measurement at another point. What's the math there, Rich? You have to subtract 1406 from 1411. How much from 6 to 11? Five. Zero five, yeah, five. Yeah. So I just come up with a five and then, and then do the math. So around point zero five. There's another way to do that without having to do the math. So if you guys don't like math, think about where you put your leads. If you want to know the difference between two points, you can measure point one and then measure point two and do the math. Or you can measure from 
point one two point two and we're getting point oh four it's a little more accurate it's kind of a rounding error so that's the only drop that's going across there from here to there we're eating four hundredths of a volt not much at all all right show of hands how many of you have heard that you can measure voltage drop across a fuse to see if current is flowing in that circuit okay everybody lower those hands how many have actually done that test show of hands again So only a few yeah, people. A okay. So I want to show you when we talk about everything has resistivity, it has a quality to it. All these fuses are the same. Okay. So I have one bulb on and I am going to measure the voltage drop across that top fuse. Trying to do this and keep your hands out of the way is a challenge. Let's do it this way. Let me switch to millivolts. So 8.6 millivolts. Everybody good with that? One bulb is on and I'm measuring 8.6 millivolts across that fuse. Now the next fuse down, that circuit is not working at all. Give me a good connection. See how that's zeroed out? There's nothing happening there. That's just meter fluctuation. There, there nice stable zero, it's settled out. What would happen if you if you followed any of that discussion and this is just one of those techniques if you followed that discussion they say that if we know the value of our fuse how many how many um, amps the fuse is rated for and the style and size of the fuse we can measure the drop across it and calculate the current flow now we're not going to get into that that's outside the scope of this class but the concept is that if I measure the drop, the amount of drop here is gonna be directly related to how much current is flowing through the circuit. So if I measured, what, eight here, Rich, 8.6? Mm -hmm. If I turn this circuit on and it's theoretically flowing three times as much current because these bulbs are all in parallel, what should my voltage drop be across this fuse? Should be three times as much. So if I don't like math, but I can go three times eight is what? 24, hopefully. Okay. So three times eight is 24. Oh, look. <laughs> 24. Maths. Maths work. Okay. Three times the drop across that fuse because I have three times the load. Do you guys find that kind of stuff helpful? Show of hands, yes or no? How many people have pulled fuses trying to chase a draw? Uh, I know I've done it. I've been in to help guys find that they pulled out one of the fuses and it ended up being a diode and they put it back in backwards. And now something on the car doesn't work. But it looked just like a fuse, but it was a diode. So this is a way we don't disturb anything and we can actually use those laws of voltage drop to take a measurement. And I'll do one other thing. I'm gonna switch my meter over to actually measure that current. And if I pull the fuse and I use my meter, I use my meter to complete the circuit I got about 262 milliamps. 
So I should see three times that or somewhere around 750 milliamps. Oh, look, 740, pretty close on the math. The next thing that we can do, and I'm gonna show you guys something else here. Hey, Rich, do you have your DC circuit kit open? Yes. I'm gonna stop my share. Okay. And why don't you go ahead and put up that DC circuit kit and while you're doing it, I'm gonna explain where it comes from so that we, we stay right with that group. All right. Um, and then I want you to use that kit as a way to talk about the rules for a series circuit. Fair enough? All right. Sounds good. All right. You seeing it? Absolutely. It looks great. Okay. All right. Good. So folks, while Rich is going to, Rich is going to be grabbing components and you can watch him work while I'm talking. Um, but this is something that you can download onto your tablet, PC, laptop, anything that can run an HTML5 type file. This is from the University of Colorado Boulder and PHET down here in the bottom stands for their physics education training department. For anybody that feels like they need or want a little bit of practice or they want to play with things to get the concepts locked down in their head, you can go download simulations like this. This is just one of them. Well, I'll show you another one later maybe. Um, but it allows you to build circuits and then you have tools like voltmeters and amp meters and you can change the resistivity of the wire to make it realistic. Um, and build a circuit and play with it. And it's, it's, it's free to use. It's free for teachers to use. Um, you basically just have to give credit to who has it and where it came from. So we've just done that. Go, go grab it. If you like what you see, you know, colleges and stuff are always looking for support for these programs. If you uh, happen to be good at programming, they have some of these that are still Java files that they would love for people to convert to HTML5 because it'll work on more devices. But all right, Rich, it's all you. Oh, you put a fuse in it. No fires. Darn. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll do our best here. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, Jim gave a great description of this program, and, and it is fantastic. One of the really nice things about it is we can do things wrong. And if we do things wrong, like take a wire and whoops and dead short a circuit, something's going to happen. Our fuse blows. Well, it's a lot cheaper to hit this button and reset the fuse. So I guess we should get rid of that wire. Then reset the fuse. There we go. But the Much first, the first way you showed it happens a lot. I went, <laughs> I went through a whole boxes of fuses. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Um, and if you want to get really bad, we can set the battery on fire. Uh, okay. Let's get rid of that. So it allows us to build a circuit. It allows us, if we want to, to add resistance to build a circuit with unwanted resistance. We see current flow and it allows us to change the voltage. If I increase the voltage, I increase the pressure. The light gets brighter and we have more current flowing through the circuit. Let's go back to something we're a little used to around 14 volts. Let's get this resistor out of there for a second. And as Jim was doing earlier, we were doing some voltage testing. We have 14 volts available at the source. If we're doing checks of a fuel pump, uh, one of our first things is what's our source voltage? What's the battery or the electrical system got at the front of the car? So that when I get to the back of the car, I can, I can make some educated decisions on what's going on. And you'll notice over here, wire resistivity. You can set up a very realistic voltage drop. So as I move this, my voltage drops. Across the fuse, it drops a little more. We see 14 volts available at the source, 13.9 available at the bulb. And again, 
we can move the leads wherever we want and we see the difference in voltage. So like Jim showed earlier, the difference between 14 volts and 13.9, about 0 0.09, or we can just use the leads and it does the math for us. Now I've got those reversed, but it's still going to give us the same number. We just got to ignore that little minus does, sign. Does, does it matter if they're reversed? To me, no. Because 0.9 or 0.09 still is just showing the difference between those two points, right? Ex exactly. Okay. And uh, Dylan, I, Dylan says, I've always liked electron flow instead of conventional. And it's, it, it, I, I, I like it too. It makes sense to me. But for a lot of people, uh, it, uh, oh, energy doesn't flow that way. It's, uh, the, the feed side is called the power side. Notice up here, we can change it to conventional power flow. So if that works better for you, it doesn't change the math. It doesn't change Ohm's law. It's just a visual representation of current flowing or, or energy flowing through the circuit. So however, you, however it makes sense to you, you can do it. Oh, oh, Ohm's law. Oh, what, what, what's this Ohm's law of what you speak? Ohm's law is uh, it takes one uh, volt of pressure to push one current. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, one amp of current through one ohm of resistance. So, so here in this circuit, if I drop the voltage down to one, That's a dead battery. If I have one volt, and I know bulbs are a terrible example of resistance, but if we set that bulb to one ohm of resistance, and we take our amp clamp, we put it around the wire. Let's get rid of our resistivity there. One volt of pressure in, uh -oh. in the battery is pushing one amp of current through one ohm of resistance. So, yeah. so yeah, so we're, we're, this program uses bulbs and bulbs are a, kind of a unique thing. Ohm's law doesn't work on them. If you measured the resistance of a bulb, you're going to get a pretty low number. And if you tried to calculate and say, okay, I've got this much resistance and this many volts, what's my current flow going to be? When you turn it on and check it, the math doesn't work, does it, guys? The reason the math is not going to work is because, answer in chat, what happens to resistance with temperature? As temperature goes up, resistance changes. Resistance follows temperature. It's from, from the vast majority of components. So if I increase the temperature of a wire, its resistivity is going to go up. If I increase the, the, the temperature of a, uh, a, a relay or a coil or an injector, the resistance level is going to go up. It's going to change. And if you think about what happens with a traditional incandescent bulb like this, um, as soon as you turn it on, what happens to it? How many of you guys like to try and unscrew a working bulb with your fingers? Yeah, no, no, it's not, not recommended at all. Um, no way. Exactly. Good answer. We'll do an oil change, but we won't take out a bulb. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. But for the purpose of an exercise and learning the laws and the rules and how things behave, view these bulbs as a load. It could be in simplistic terms, it could be a motor, it could be a solenoid, it could be almost anything you want it to be. And if we change the voltage, we will change the amount of work being done because of Ohm's law. So, Rich, what do you have your, um, what do you have your voltage and resistance set to now? Well, if uh, everybody was paying attention, I blew a couple fuses there. I increased the battery voltage up to 14 volts and I set the bulb resistance to 14 ohms. And so, so the ratio or the, the, the relationship between voltage and resistance of the load, you've kept the same. So the current flow has stayed the same. Yes. And okay. uh, 
if you were to think about maybe a fuel injector and you know that the fuel injectors spec is 13 14 ohms you know what the car's electrical system is if you are going to do tests you know, you already know what to expect okay so show of hands in the room how many of you guys use a scope right now you how many of you use a scope You've got a few. Okay. So you're going to check a fuel injector current. Which, which wire do you go around from the injector? If you just want to check one injector, one, one load, do you go to the power side or the ground side? Either, either. Right? Current is the same at all points in a series circuit. Right? You go to the wire that's the easiest to get to. Now, does that work in a parallel circuit? Are you gonna get the same are you gonna get the same reading everywhere in a parallel circuit? <laughs> Uh, answer Franc Francisco says what's with the dog I have no idea yeah we, <laughs> you shouldn't be testing the resistivity of a dog okay um, but remember this is built for students and boredom can set in and so they can have interesting conversations but I you know I don't know if you if you had the opportunity to take um, was it Francisco who who did the um, no, it was it was Dirk from ZF. He did a series on hybrid electrical. And he was talking about how they train techs in Europe and the things that they have to know about what level of um what level of voltage will produce current flow that's damaging to the human body. Um, and they go through all the math on stuff like that. And so I guess the dog is there to make an example. Rich, are you building a parallel circuit? Is that I am, but I, it gets a little busy. I think your board might be better for that. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do is I'm actually, while, while you're doing that, um, I was building a parallel circuit that was not so busy. So you um, want to go back to your screen? Well, yeah, we'll get we'll get there in a second. You can continue okay. on with what you're doing until I until I get there, but I'm pretty I'm pretty close right now. So All right. Yeah, let me let me jump in and let me jump in and share my screen because um What do you think of All this right. one? What do you that's think? That's a one? little yeah, that's a little cleaner. I was doing it on the fly. <laughs> All the bulbs are the same. Oops. <laughs> what did I do wrong? Okay. Hang on a second. What's going to happen to the current flow when I add this one on? It shows more. Now, it, it appears to pick up the speed, but we're not really picking up speed. It's just the, it's the graphics way of showing that we have more current flow. So I don't have the fancy amp meter that Rich does. Yeah, there's two different versions of this lab. There's there's two two different versions of this lab, but I can put this in here and I can say, okay, um, we're now measuring 
the total current in this parallel circuit. And if you want to do conventional there, it's still showing 4.2 amps. If we have a series circuit and we put a break anywhere in it, current flow stops, right? With a parallel circuit, it doesn't stop. It just continues to flow through the sections of the circuit that are the same, but total current flow goes down, all right? It goes down. So if I add another leg in, it, it increases. So depending on where I make my measurement, if I, if I break this right here and I go grab another amp meter, Now I have 4.2 for the total circuit, but if I measure just the current to this particular load, I measure 1.4. If all these are equal, 1.4 plus 1.4 is 2.8, and 2.8 plus 1.4, or I, yeah. 3.8 plus 0 0.4 is 4.2, right? So the flow through each one of these legs are the same, but the total current is the sum of those three legs. And so that's how it changes when we start talking about a, another circuit. All right, so if we look at our board, we can actually see the exact same thing. In a series circuit, in a series circuit, if we add loads, what happens to current, Rich? If we put another load in series, what happens? Oh, current drops. Current's going to drop, right? That's one of the rules. So with one bulb on, I got 0.263. If I add a second bulb in, my total current has dropped to 182 milliamps, okay? But when I go to the parallel circuit and turn it on, I've got almost three quarters of an amp. And if I take one of them out, if they're all the same, what should my current flow be? Fewer pathways, less total current. But if we know that they're all the same, we should be able to make an estimation. If I've got roughly three quarters now and I take one away, I should drop to about a half. And I certainly did. All right. Mm -hmm. Now we talked about resistance, desired resistance and undesired resistance. Let me put my fuse back in. And I'm going to connect here. And I'm going to turn off this ground path. Now, if I had resistance somewhere, would I reduce the amount of voltage available to those bulbs in parallel? I apparently did. Right? You seeing it drop? You seeing the bulbs dim down? So let's do that with just one bulb. Can you guys see that the tone of that bulb is a little bit dimmer than the others? If you really want to mess with it, I can go there. Yes. Or I can turn that back on and I can go here and just dim this one bulb. There you go. Okay. So if I'm doing my, if I'm going back to my voltage measurements and I had a car, let's say I had three brake lights, had a high mount stop light and two tail lights. And let's just say for the purpose of this car, um, all those bulbs are the same and they're all fed off the brake light switch. Um, they're supposed to all be the same bulb, but the bulb in the right rear of the vehicle is dim like this when you hit the brakes. What could cause that 
condition. Give me a list of things. Corroded socket. socket. That's a good answer. Bad ground. <laughs> a different wattage of bulb. Different bulb. Yep. Different bulb. Okay. Bad ground again. All right. So if I am testing, I want to know what my source is, right? So I check my source. Oops on the correct setting on the meter, check my source. Hey, I didn't blow a fuse. <laughs> I was I got, just gonna say. <laughs> I, and I got 14 volts. Now, I, if I wanna check my power side, I can go and look at each bulb. 1393, 1393, 1393. Do I have a problem on the power side? Nope. No, you know, J James Miller, um, I like the way you answered the question, extra resistance. That is a, at least for my purposes, the way my brain works with electricity, that's a good mental model is you're telling yourself, okay, I've got an issue here and I've got performance and I have extra resistance. It could be the load itself that particular bulb is incorrect. It could be on the feed side. It could be on the ground side. And you just need to find out where that problem is. So that test we just did, we went across and checked the power feed to each bulb. And that appears to be good. One of the tests I like to do is to go across the load. And so I go across this load and out of that 14.01, this bulb is getting a meal of 13.91. This bulb, 13.91. This bulb is only getting just under nine volts. Just under nine volts, 8.83. Now, if I hadn't done the other test, What's the fastest way to figure out whether it's a feed side or a ground side problem? Just move one lead. Just move one lead, Rich says. One of the things I like to do is I like to take my um, ground lead and go to a known good ground. I found my source voltage. So I know the problem is on the ground side. So if I follow that ground side, problem's not there. I just found my other five volts, didn't I? I just found my other five volts. So I've got to fix this ground circuit. And just to show you that you know, you see guys do overlays and things like this. And for testing purposes, I got no issue with it. So if I overlay a ground, did I just fix that? Yep. 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 So following those rules, following those laws, you're going to find issues like that real quick. Um, what else, Rich? What else should we should we talk about here? If I have, we, we said if we have no current flow, if we have no current flow, can we still use voltage to test this circuit? Yes, no? James Miller says yes, I'm going with him. Okay. James, your tag, you're it then. So I'm going to hook up. I'm going to hook up to a good ground circuit. I'm going to go here at source. I got really long test leads for my meter so I can make it all the way to the back of the car. 14, 14, 14. Go to the ground side. Uh-oh. That shouldn't be, right? That shouldn't be. So we know that because there's no current flow, 
we have, could it be three burned out bulbs? Could be. What's the likelihood of that? Pretty unlikely. Well, You'll with see our customers, probably likely. Well, yeah, they haven't been into the shop with their car since February. Um, could be all kinds of different things. Lottery odds. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Just because it's new doesn't mean it means good, right? <clears throat> so it could be that the loads themselves are open and there's no current flow. But what we've proved is is that we have voltage to the devices and we have voltage through the devices and we have voltage all the way to this ground point. And so the problem is between here and source ground. And in this case, it happens to be a switch. Okay. So Rich, I just came up with another way of demonstrating a conversation that we've had in the past. And I'm going to go right here. I'm going to turn this one off. And I'm going to ask the room a question. Have you ever had a car come in? And let's say this is a device like, oh, this is an O2 heater on a car. This is the O2 heater. And normally on a lot of cars these days, Heaters are turned on and off. This is finger width modulated or pulse width <laughs> modulated, <laughs> right? It's turned on and off going for a target temperature on the heater. But regardless, let's say it's a, a shift solenoid in a transmission. could be almost anything. And the computer sets a code for the circuit being open, which means we have a break in it, or shorted to ground. All right, so I'm gonna use this board to pretend to be a computer with a transistor in it and a logic circuit. The computer is controlling that device by turning this transistor on and off. It's monitoring the voltage here and whether or not the button is pushed. Okay, so with the circuit off, the computer expects to see voltage, right? When it turns the circuit on, it expects that voltage to drop to nearly zero. But what the computer is seeing is it doesn't see the voltage ever, whether or not this is on or off, okay? So, the computer says the circuit is open, right? Because it doesn't see any voltage and it could be a break in a wire on the ground side or on the control side. It could be that the bulb is bad. It could be that the switch is open. The fuse is blown, could be almost anything on either side of the circuit. So there's why it says the circuit is open. Or it says, The circuit shorted to ground. So what I've just demonstrated there is I'm the computer and I'm watching here for voltage and I never see it. But the device is working because it found another path to ground. Like somebody pinched this wire in the bell housing when they had the transmission out. And now the device is working all the time. The reason the computer gives you a code for both situations is because it's only doing the voltage drop at one point in the circuit. And that's why it's our job to be methodical and patient and to write down results and look at the circuit in the rest of the way and find out, okay, this is shorted to ground because the voltage is consumed here and the device is working. Um, or it's actually open and I gotta figure out why. Is that helpful, yes or no? How many people were, how many, show of hands, how many people were confused the first time they read a code description like that, open or shorted to ground? Oh yeah, all of us. 
Yeah. And, you know, they, they, they never really explained it. If a computer had all the wires going to every point on the circuit everywhere, um, you know, the wiring harness would be huge. And what, what did you say, Rich? It would have a Mercedes emblem on the hood. Yes. Or, yeah. No, yeah. They're, and they're, all the manufacturers are getting better. Um, but think about that. We're, we're trying to do things with logic now and, and distributed power and things like that. And it's getting better, but we have to still stay on our toes with how we're going to approach a problem. Um, any of the basic elements of Ohm's law or series or parallel circuit behavior that you can think we should review? Pete, Rich, anybody? I think we got it pretty good. Does anybody have any questions about it? My, Bob, I love that. He says, my reaction was make up your mind. Or as I used to say it, I will admit, make up my mind. Um, <laughs> hey, Pete, you're muted if you were saying something. Not sure why the space bar is not working, but uh, anyway. No, it's always good to review how the circuit design affects your approach into the circuit. Um, and that's why it's always good to read a schematic and understand the circuit a little bit uh, before you go into testing it physically with voltmeters. Understand your point of entry where you can maybe cheat a little bit and get the same results without having to go and do it multiple times within the circuit. That's why it's always good to look at the circuit, the uh, the schematics design to see if there's other ways we could achieve the results when we go to make the tests physically on the car. Pete, um, thank you. You just reminded me of something I always like to point out in an electrical class. You remember when I was showing over here at the source that as I turned more loads on the board, it stressed the circuit more and my voltage just kept going down, 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 down. Now they were minute, they were small things, but additional loads impacted upstream. And so one of the things I always like to remind myself and anybody I get a chance to talk to is, look, if you have a car come in and there is a complaint of some type of a behavior or an electrical problem with a specific device component or system. When Pete says get out a schematic and look at that circuit design, one of the ones that I find myself going to pretty early is power and ground distribution. Because if I have a complaint with a component, the problem may not show up until I turn on a bunch of loads that are also on that same power distribution leg or side of the car or mega, mega fuse or something. Once I, okay, I couldn't get the stereo to act up, but once I turned on X, Y, Z, A, and D, now all of a sudden the stereo starts acting up because I created a voltage issue that wasn't going to show up until there was enough load on the circuit. Had a late 90s, early 2000s GM. And, you know, as, as time went on, we knew that they had water leaks and things like this. And this car had been to multiple different shops and it had had fuel pumps, ignition components, um, coil packs, different things that had been towed in a couple of times and darts are being thrown at it. And a guy would complain, sometimes the dash gets wacky, sometimes the engine starts running rough, um, a whole bunch of different related symptoms. And so he finally brought the vehicle into us and we took it out on a test drive and, and got it to act up, confirmed his complaint, made it back to the shop. And what we did was printed out a wiring diagram multiple wiring diagrams uh, that covered all the components that he had had complaints about. And what we found was that a bunch of them shared a common ground. And where was that common ground? It was in the left side of the driver's footwell 
against the rocker panel. There was a ground comb in there that a bunch of components were plugged into. So hopped back in the car. We haven't taken anything apart on the car yet. Hopped back in the car, went for a test drive, took my boot and kicked the left side rocker panel. And the car almost died on the spot. Kicked it again and it came back. You could almost like, stop it, do it again, stop it, do it again. And so, okay, <laughs> percussive maintenance, peeled the carpet back, found all the corrosion, replaced all those wire ends, put a nice solid ground path back in, and the car was fixed. This car had, had $1,400 worth of work done to it, and all it really was was fixing a bad ground cluster inside the car. So those are the ones that like stick in your head to make sure you look at the vehicle as a system. Do you agree with that, Pete? Absolutely. And the other I'm thing sure. is, if, if there are multiple loads and you're just fixing the load that the customer is complaining about, always check the rest of the loads that are on that circuit after you're done. Follow up and make sure each one of them works, you know, correctly and nothing else that we turn on like a left turn signal or you know the license plate lights when the running lights are on in that circumstance does anything to affect the circuit's operation after we're done repairing it don't, don't ever think for one second that there's only one problem <laughs> and uh i i would i just want to add one thing M mike Heron said, understanding circuit design design is critical, and, and it absolutely is. Sometimes, based on the symptom or the complaint, you may look at the wiring diagram and say to yourself, oh, this can only be this problem, because you understand how the circuit has to work. So analyzing that wiring diagram is key to, oh, there's an easy spot to do my test, and I know what the possible problem is. Right. right. We've, we've covered the basics. Um, I hope you guys see that this really, understanding these things really is the foundation. You start adding into that pulse width, you start adding into that other laws like Lenz's law and Faraday's law, you start getting into charging system operation, you start getting into a lot of other things. And, and that would be, you know, conversation two of this little um, smorgasbord on electrical. And, you know, we're probably gonna do that in the future. I want to thank all of our panelists, all of our participants today. Hope you guys stay safe out there. Let me share one thing with you before we wrap it up today. And that is, you can find us on CTI online, search training and virtual classroom. That link will be in your email. My email address will also be in that follow-up email. So if you have any questions, uh, there was a question in there about details of the training board. Just send me an email on that. I'll make sure that gets to the right people or I'll answer it myself. We also have the CTI and WTI members Facebook group available. And so uh, look out for that, ask for membership for that, and uh, we'll get you in that group also so you can follow our uh, follow the goings on. Um, and also you're gonna see a little uh, survey come up. So if you could take a minute and complete that survey, we'll, uh, you'll have a hand in making this a better product and help us do a better job for you. So that being said, guys, uh, have a great weekend. Stay safe out there. We'll see you next week with Peter Orlando and uh, stay tuned for more uh, fun and games with Foundational Electrics. So, see you soon. Thank you.